Roberto Bretzel nasceu com a intenção de ser um jeito inovador de se comunicar. Surge o um momento de um contexto conturbado, ou seja, no meio da pandemia, e havia e ainda há uma profusão de conteúdos que estão sendo disponibilizados virtualmente online. A concepção deste projeto foi uma iniciativa da Associação dos Amigos da Universidade Hebraica de Jerusalém, em parceria com a Sinagoga Betel, e conta com o apoio institucional do Clube A Hebraica e do Museu Judaico de São Paulo. Agradecemos aos patrocinadores e apoiadores que têm nos ajudado a viabilizar esse projeto. Destacamos o Grupo Rossetti. Espero que desfrutem dessa entrevista. Peter, welcome. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. How are you? Very good. Thank you very much for having me and uh, greetings from Israel, from Tel Aviv in Israel. Good. Welcome again. So let's start. We're going to have uh, some questions. I'm going to make some questions to you and you're going to answer, okay? Sure. First, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you born and where you do currently live. Um, I was originally born in New York um, in 1957 in New York City. Um, my parents were, were immigrants from, uh, from Europe. Um, and I lived in New York for most of my life, for my, my younger life. Um, and then I moved to, I was, I came to Israel on and off over the years because we had a lot of family in Israel. Um, and I've been living here permanently now for, let's see, about 32 years. When my son was six months old, we came back to live in Israel for good. And I live in, I live in Givatayim, which is a suburb of Tel Aviv. How was your life in the United States? Where did you live? Tell me a little bit about this. Um, well, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a little bit about my, my family and my background because my parents have an interesting story. Um, my father is from uh, Ukraine, from Romania, from Chernovitz, which was in Romania at the time. Today it's Ukraine. Um, he had a, a very Zionist upbringing with the Shomer Tzair, um, and obviously the war came and, uh, and, and ruined a lot of what was happening with him, so he was able to go underground um, and get to Italy. He arrived in Italy. Um, my mother came from Hungary. My mother was actually in Hungary. She went through the whole war in Hungary. Um, her and her sister hid out in, in, in Budapest. They're from Debreton. Um, and after the war, she wanted to come and uh, make Aliyah to immigrate to, uh, to Palestine. Um, and she came through to Italy. And my father at the time was working for the Jewish agency. And he was helping all the Jews immigrate from the Jews who came to Italy to help them go to Palestine at the time. Um, and my mother was there and they met. Um, and they didn't have a common language because my father knew Russian, he knew Yiddish, um, he knew a, a few languages, and my mother didn't know Yiddish because at the time, the Hungarian, most of the Hungarian people were pretty integrated into the society and they didn't really know Yiddish very well, very much. Um, but the two of them met and three weeks later they got married. So they got married in Italy and they ended up living in Italy. My father sent much of his family, his two sisters and his mother to Palestine, to Israel. And he also sent my, my mother's father to Palestine, to Israel, um, but they stayed in Italy. They stayed in Italy through the war and they stayed in Italy for also 10 years after that. Um, my father would go to Israel every year to visit the family there. He had a very nice life in, his, in, in, in Rome. Um, he would bring fruits and vegetables to, to Palestine, to Israel at the time. Israel was a very difficult situation in the 1950s. He would sell a lot of it for his, his, his boat passage. Um, the rest of it he would give to the family. And then in, um, in the story is my sister was born in Italy, in Rome. And the story is when she was four years old, she passed a church and she went like this. So they said, now it's time to leave Italy and to go to the Holy Land. And they decided to go to America. <laughs> so they came to America and I was born in New York. And that's, uh, that's the story. Ironically, a few years ago, um, we, we got all the paperwork from the joint. They came to America with the joint. Um, they spent, I didn't realize this, but they spent 10 years in Italy as stateless people. They had no citizenship, they had no rights, they were, they were refugees in Italy. You think today of the Palestinian refugees, but you have to realize that after the war, many Jews were refugees. And until they didn't come to America, um, and they were there and they got citizenship in the United States, and the United States accepted them and everything, they were refugees who were just uh, trying to find a, a place to live and to, 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 to live a life. And I was born in America. I was their, their jewel that was born in America and lived life as an American. Uh, that's great. That's a fascinating story. Thank you. Thank you to share with us. That's, uh, 
that's really a fascinate for, for, for us. And tell me a little bit, what you, do you like or and dislike the most about in our Eretz Israel? So that's a long time that you live there. Yes, I've been here for a very long time. Um, I don't regret it. Um, we came here when my first daughter was born in New York. She, she, actually, I was, um, during my, my, my childhood, um, growing up in, in the United States, we came to visit Israel often. Um, we came in 1961 uh, when I was uh, four years old. That was the first time we came by boat. Um, we actually came in 1967, two weeks after the Six Day War. And I was 10 years old at the time and, and I was in Israel the whole summer. And to be in Israel in the summer of 1967 was just euphoria. The country was, was fantastic, was enthusiastic. We went to Jerusalem. My father took his mother and his sisters to Jerusalem. My father was the, the American, the rich American who came to Israel in 1967. He took the whole family to Jerusalem. We went to Jerusalem. We went to Ramallah. We went to Hebron. Uh, we went to Bethlehem. We went to all the places where for the first time Israelis could go. Um, and, and even the Palestinians there were very happy because all of a sudden they had tourists and everything coming there. Um, Israel was, 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 was an incredible uh, sensation then. I came back from Israel to America. My wall in my room was plastered with pictures of Moshe Dayan and Sahal and Kol HaKavod Sahal and what a great victory it was. Um, and it was a very enthusiastic uh, kind of period of time. Um, the second thing that happened in 1969, I was a child growing up in New York And I became a baseball fan. And uh, the, the New York Mets um, in 1969, they were called the Miracle Mets. So the Mets won the World Series in 1969. And I was very enthusiastic about that. So those two things, um, when I was 10 years old and when I was 12 years old, are where my life is today. Because today I'm living in Israel. I'm involved in baseball in Israel. Here's the, uh, the symbol of it. Um, and, and by chance, those two things that happened 50 years ago is where I am today. So afterwards we came, we visited very often. In 1973, I came just before the Yom Kippur War. Um, Israel was then a much different country afterwards. Um, I came again in 76 and in 79. Um, and I, fin I did my studies in the United States. And after my studies in the United States, I came to Israel and I did my master's degree in Israel. I met the woman who is today my, my wife. Um, we got married in Israel. Um, and then we decided to come back to America for one year. I wanted to bring her back. She's Israeli. I wanted to bring her back to see the family, to get to know the family. So one year became five years. And uh, you know how these things happen. You just, it develops and you stay there. Um, and, and one daughter was born in the States and a second son was born. And when he was six months old in, uh, in 1989, we moved back to Israel and we've been in Israel since. Um, I love Israel. You know, I mean, I'm a Zionist, a Zionist at heart. My father was a Zionist. They say this, the sign of a Zionist is somebody who sends his son to Israel. So my father was a Zionist because he sent me to Israel. And I'm living there today. Um, and I love it. I love the enthusiasm. I love the, the warmth, um, the, the balagan, people who know Hebrew, uh, the, 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 big, the big mess. Um, but everybody is so warm. Everybody is so warm and together and doing one thing. Um, I don't like the politics so much. That's what draws us apart. Um, but as the Jewish people, um, being in Israel, living in Israel as the Jewish people, it's the Jewish homeland. I am not religious, um, but I believe in the Jewish heritage very much. And for me, that Jewish heritage and being there and being part of Israel and being part of the Jewish people and building something, you know, I also feel American. I mean, it, it's ironic, but in Israel, I am much more the American than I was in America because I have my accent in Hebrew. Um, and I also ended up gravitating to things that are very American because baseball is very American. So a lot of my friends are American as well, but I still feel Israeli. I still feel Israeli, I feel very much a part of it. I did army service, I did uh, basic training, I did my army service, I went every year from Miluim. Um, so I'm very much an Israeli, my wife is Israeli. My kids also live both worlds. I mean, my kids are now older, I have a granddaughter already, um, but my kids, when they were growing up, they went every year, every summer, they went to the United States to visit their grandparents. Um, and they're very much live in both societies and both worlds. My son was also a baseball player and he's a baseball coach now. Um, but, but again, living here with all the problems recently and the political situation and everything, which is maybe not to my liking, um, it's still a situation where just being the Jewish people and being there together is very much, uh, very much in favor. And that's what I, I feel very much of a Zionist pride to be living in Israel, even today. Ah, that's great, that's great. That's, uh, 
uh, <coughs> share the story of about the Jewish people, no? This kind of mix that uh, born in some place and uh, and raised children in another place, and so that's uh, that's the our 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 destiny, you know, in, in general. Very good. Uh, so, what's your background in professional activity? What made you move to Israel? You share with us now. What uh, share with a little, a little bit about uh, the decision maker process? It was clear, but uh, in the end of the day, what was the final decision? What what was so important for you to make this kind of decision? Besides the fact that your wife is an Israeli. It helps that my wife is an Israeli. It helps in the integration. There's no doubt about it. Ironically, her background is also very mixed, uh, just like every, all other Jewish people. Her mother is Hungarian and her father is Iraqi. Okay, so there you have that great mix of the Ashkenazi and the Sephardi coming together. My children are 25% uh, Sephardi, 75% Ashkenazi. Um, but that's, that's, the, that's, the melting pot, that, that's the melting pot of Israel. Um, when we were in the States, as I mentioned, for one year, um, that became five years, I started working for an Israeli company, a company called Core Trade, Core K-O-K-O-O-R, which was the biggest company in Israel at the time. Um, and we did all their marketing and trade in the United States for the Israeli companies. So naturally, when I went back to Israel, I got a job with one of the core companies, which was Hamat, um, which was the faucet company. That, they're a faucet manufacturer, a grifier, griferia, I believe is uh, the, the word in, in Spanish. Not in Portuguese, I don't know Portuguese what the word is but a faucet or a tap. Um, and they're the biggest manufacturer in Israel. They also manufacture sinks, uh, fire clay, toilets. Um, so for many years, I was working for them as their export manager. Um, about 10 years ago, I became independent. I also work with them, but I also work with other manufacturers in Israel who want to export their products, um, all different kinds of products that I export from Israel to the States, to Europe. Um, uh, and I'm also, again, working for, for baseball. I mean, what I do for baseball takes up a lot of my time today, um, a, a lot more of my time than my wife uh, appreciates. Um, you can imagine that being Israeli, she doesn't really know anything about baseball, except that her husband and her son are crazy about it, um, because my son is just as crazy as I am. Um, but uh, I'm able to somehow integrate my, my work together, my independent work of being a marketing person, together with my love for baseball and, and doing baseball. Um, and it's very much of, of, of being, you know, coming into Israel and being sort of like a big fish in a small pond or in America being a, a small fish in a large pond. So I chose to, to be here. Um, I'm very much involved in the life of the industry here in Israel while, while it's going on economically. Um, my son also has a fund, funds that he's uh, uh, taking care of and uh, investment and everything. Um, and he's very successful as an investment banker. Um, and we love the life in Israel. I mean, you know, life for us is good here. As I mentioned, I have a granddaughter. She's two years old, perfect age. I was just picking her up today. Um, every Sunday, I pick her up from the gun, from the daycare, take her around for a couple of hours. We go to the to the playground and everything. And there's no doubt that that is the is the height of my of my week. Those two hours with my granddaughter. That's that's beautiful. Very good. Very good. Uh, so uh, we are not so familiar with the baseball in Brazil. Could you tell us about the origin of this sport? What are its main fundamentals besides the United States? In which other countries is the sport popular? Okay, um, first of all, the origins of baseball. Baseball must be at least 150 to 180 years old. It's been around since the 1850s. Um, it, was, it was originally in America, but today there are about uh, 75 countries all over the world that play baseball that are very involved with baseball, um, including European countries. There's about 35 countries in Europe. I was the vice president of European baseball as well as being the president of baseball in Israel for four years. So baseball is popular. And obviously it's most popular in America, um, but even in America, the major league baseball is about 35, 40% foreign. So Japan, it's, it's a crazy sport. Japan, it's the number one sport by far. In Korea, in all the countries around there, Taiwan, um, it's a very big sport. Um, also in Central America, in uh, Dominican Republic, in Cuba, in Venezuela, in Colombia, it's very big. In South America, less so, although Brazil also has a national team. Um, by the way, in, in, in 2016, um, in the WBC, in the World Baseball Classic, um, in the qualifiers in Brooklyn, 
Uh, Israel played against uh, the UK, uh, Pakistan, and Brazil, the Brazilian national team, which was at the time they, there was an American guy, uh, Barry, Barry Larkin. He was the manager of the team. Um, the team, there were a lot of uh, Japanese Brazilians on the team. I understand Brazil has a large Japanese population. So that's probably where the influence was. It came in there. Um, and we defeated uh, Brazil, luckily, 1-0, one 1-0. One it was a very close game until the last innings. Um, and it's good that Israel defeated Brazil because then we made the stepping stone up until the main tournament of the World Baseball Classic. Um, but that's, that's, that we'll talk about later. Um, but but it, actually, Brazil has about four or five major leaguers. There's one a very good guy, uh, Jan Gomez. Um, he's Brazilian. He was born in Sao Paulo. Um, and he played baseball somehow in Brazil. I know that he went to the States, I think, when he was about 10 years old. And they moved to Miami. So I think maybe that's one of the reasons. But he grew up in Sao Paulo. Um, and also in Israel today. We're having kids, you know, grow up in Israel, learning the base, baseball in Israel. There's about 1,000 kids today playing baseball in Israel. Um, we have an academy for the, the most talented players from the ages of uh, 15 to 18. So we're building the program. We're building up the young people. Um, I'm very proud of the Olympic team, which we'll talk about, but also our, our U18 team, our under 18 years old team. Last summer, they won the European Championship B pool. So this next summer, they'll be in the, uh, in the European Championship A pool. So they're also, the, the, and those, are, those are guys who only grew up in Israel. Some of the, the Olympic team is mostly American Jews. But these are guys who grew up in Israel, kids who grew up in Israel, learned, the base, learned baseball in Israel and, and became very good at it. And a lot of countries are doing that. A lot of countries are falling in love with the sport. It's, it's in, it's, you don't have to be tall, especially like in basketball. You don't have to be fast, perhaps like in, like in football. Um, you need to have good hand-eye coordination. That's very important because you have to, you have to hit the ball. Um, um, and, and vision is very important. But it's, it seems like a complicated game, but it's actually a simple game. I mean, you have, to, you have to know how to throw. You have to learn how to catch. And you have to learn how to hit. That's it. Those are the three basic things. And for children, small children, you can break down all those basic uh, things to very basic instructions and very basic training. Um, and they can, learn the, they can learn the sport quite quickly. When you go to a major league baseball game in America, there's a lot of it around it. A lot of the surrounding, you know, you want a hot dog and you want to drink a beer and you want to go see some other things and see some, you know, they have uh, competitions and all kinds of different things going around because it's not, it's not the fastest game. It's not football where people are running action all the time. There's, there's breaks in the action. So you have to, it's a, it's, a, it's a game of patience and you have to be very patient to watch the game, but it's a very exciting game, really. Very good, very good. Just, just, to, the, just to, you know, that the, the Japanese community here in Brazil, it's really big. Uh, if I'm not wrong, it's the second, uh, the largest uh, Japanese community besides the Japan. So that's a oh, really okay. very uh, important Japanese com community. Very good, okay. very good. Nice. Well, let's talk about uh, your dream now. What did you dream when you were forming the Israeli baseball team? What, is, what was the level of this sport in Israel you mentioned for us? Is there any international uh, rank, ranking? There, there's an international ranking. Actually, I was looking, I just looked up the international ranking yesterday. Um, Brazil, what number is Brazil? Uh, I believe Brazil is number 17 in the world in baseball. Israel is number 18 in the world, which is really good because 18 is high. And that's a good sign. That's a very important sign that the 18 Israel is number 18. Just very chance, good. Yeah. <laughs> and we're supposed to have Israel 18. That's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's very, very good. Um, to, to be honest, in, 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 in international baseball, I and mean, we belong to the European baseball division because we're, we're in Asia, Israel's in Asia, but obviously we cannot compete until now with other countries in Asia. Um, I also don't want to compete with Asia because Asia has Japan and has Korea. It also has the Arab countries, um, but Israel belongs to Europe. Although I want to mention something also, um, we're now working on a new tournament. We're going to be going to a tournament in March where I'm taking 12 year old teams, 12 year old Israeli national team to Dubai. So we're going to Dubai and we're going to be playing there. And just yesterday I was looking to see if Morocco has a, has a baseball team but they don't seem to have a baseball team. I don't know, baseball hasn't caught on much in Morocco. Um, I don't know if you heard the news, but maybe in Bhutan, uh, Bhutan has 700,000 people. So I don't know if they have a baseball team either up in Bhutan, but I don't think so. 
But anyway, we're going to Dubai, so there is more relationship with our with our with our neighbors now. Um, but Israel belongs in the European Association. We go for European championships. We were always in the B pool, someplace in the lower part of the B pool. Um, in 2012, we received an invitation from Major League Baseball. Uh, they, they made the World Baseball Classic. The World Baseball Classic is like the Mondial in, in soccer, in, in football. So you have countries competing. And for the first time, they had a qualifier. So they invited us to come there, um, but their rules are a little bit different, okay? The rules of the WBC says you do not have to have a citizenship, okay? You just have to be eligible for citizenship, okay? So maybe if somebody is Brazilian, and they live in America um, and they never lived in Brazil, but maybe their grandmother was from Brazil and they can get Brazilian citizenship, then they can play for the Brazilian national team without having citizenship. So for Israel, any Jewish American can get citizenship in Israel right away because of the law of return. Anybody who has a Jewish grandparent can have citizenship. Also anybody married to someone who has a Jewish grandparent can get citizenship. So that opens up a nice area for us. Um, but basically, I mean, Israel has, what, 9 million people, and maybe there's another 8 or 9 million of Jews in America. So we're talking about a population group of maybe 17 million to go to the World Baseball Classic. So we put together a team in 2012. Uh, we went to the qualifiers. Unfortunately, we lost to Spain in the qualifiers. So that was finished. In 2016, as I mentioned, we went to Brooklyn, again, to the qualifiers. The team was made up of about uh, 23 Jewish American players and three Israelis native Israelis with passports. Um, but we, we won the qualifiers. Six months later, we went to the main tournament in Korea. Um, ESPN called us the Jamaican bobsled team because they thought we had no chance. They said, Israel has no chance. What does Israel know about baseball? There are 16 teams. Israel is the last one. Israel will come in last. So we went to Korea. We beat the Korean national team. 12 hours later, we beat the Taiwanese national team. And two days later, we beat the Netherlands national team. Um, and we were 3-0 in the first round. We went to the second round in Japan. And the next game, we beat the Cuban national team, which was amazing. I mean, that's just, the Cuban national team was a weak team. It wasn't such a strong team, but still Cuba. Baseball is God in Cuba. Uh, Fidel Castro was a baseball player. You know, if Fidel Castro had a chance to be signed by the Yankees. If he was signed by the Yankees, there wouldn't be a revolution in Cuba, but it didn't happen. So we defeated the, the, the Cuban national team. Then we lost to, to Japan, we lost to the Netherlands. In the end from 16 teams, we came in sixth place, which was very respectable. Um, Israel was definitely on the map. People were talking about Israel. We got more coverage. Um, in the United States, we got a lot of coverage. In Israel, we got some coverage, but there really wasn't that much because again, it was a team of Jewish American players. They all were playing for Israel. They all had Israel on their chest and they were very proud to play for Israel. But it was still, you know, how Israelis are very cynical. And they were saying, you know, it's not that. Nah, it's not a Jewish, it's not an Israeli team. It's not Sabras. It's not Israelis. It's so not basketball. It's not a basketball. It's not a, bas a basketball. That's exactly. Not, not, although basketball team also, I mean, the Israel basketball team has plenty of Jewish Americans, you know, black Americans on the team, but that's besides the point. Um, but they, they didn't really accept it. So in the sports world, they knew about it, the sports world in Israel. But then after the WBC, they came out about six months later um, with baseball coming back to the Olympics in Tokyo in 2020. So the announcement was made that baseball was last in the Olympics, I believe in, uh, in 2008, uh, 2008. It was the last okay. time and they came back, it's coming back in 2020 because it's in Japan. So the Japanese can choose which sports they want. They wanted baseball. Um, and, and they, they, it, it was made clear to everybody what the qualification would be. There would be six teams in baseball in the baseball tournament. There would be one team from Europe. And we had to, we were in the B pool. We were in the European Championship B pool. So we had to, we had to win four tournaments. Uh, the B pool, the playoffs, the A pool come in the top five and then the European qualifiers. And I sat down and I, I, I made a roadmap and I said, listen, this is what we have to do. And we have to start bringing Jewish American players on Aliyah. Okay, because for the Olympics, you have to have a passport. You have to be an Israeli. You have to be an Israeli citizen. So I spoke to 10 guys from the players who played for us in the WBC. And right away, they all said, you know, yeah, let's do it. You know, let's, you know, I said to them, listen, this is what we have to do. In the summer of 2019, 
We have to play in four different tournaments in four different countries in Europe over 12 weeks. So you have to fly, you have to play, you have to go back, you have to bring you back, you have to go back, you have to come back, back and forth. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if we'll win, if we have any chances, but this is the chance to get to the Olympics. And 10 Jewish American players said right away, yes. And we brought them to Israel and Aliyah in 2018. They all came to Israel. They all, it's not an easy process. You really have to fill out the paperwork and everything. It's a lot of paperwork. You have to get a rabbi's letter. You have to bring FBI report. There's a, it's a process, but they all did it. Some of them had only one parent who was Jewish. You know, some of them, some of them had bar mitzvahs, but some of them didn't have bar mitzvahs. They had no connection to Judaism, but they all came, they got their citizenship. And then in 2019, I brought four more and the team and the, those 14 guys joined uh, eight Israelis, eight native Israelis. And we went to the to Bulgaria, to the European Championship B pool, and there we played against Russia, against Greece, against Ireland, and they also they all brought uh, Ireland brought Irish American players, Greek brought Greek American players that got Greek citizenship. Russia had six Cubans on the team. I don't know how Cubans become Russian citizens, but they had them, and uh, we ended up winning that tournament. And then we had to go to Lithuania, and we had to play the Lithuanian team there. And then we went to the April, the European Championship April in September. And four more guys came to Israel to get citizenship. Among them, Danny Valencia. Danny Valencia was a major league player for 10 years. He was our best player from the, from the background, from his background. His, uh, his father is Cuban, Valencia. His father's Cuban, um, but his mother's Jewish. And his father converted to get married to his mother. So Danny had a bar mitzvah. He had, we had pictures from his bar mitzvah and everything. So he came to Israel, he made Aliyah. We went to Germany to play in the April. And for an Israeli national team to go to Germany was, was emotional for many guys. I mean, my parents, as I mentioned, were Holocaust survivors. Many of the players, their grandparents were Holocaust survivors. So there was, a, there was some inner feelings, emotions about going to Germany. Um, obviously we have protection also. The, Israeli Secret Service uh, covers the team and everything. I don't have to mention that. Um, we went there. We ended up winning the games that we had to win. The top five teams from the European Championship, from 16 teams, the top five teams the following week went to Italy to play in the uh, Olympic qualifiers. So we needed. To, we came in fourth place. We uh, 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 Netherlands won, and then Italy, and then Spain, and then Israel, and then Czech Republic. So the five teams went to Italy next the following week. The first game we played Spain, we defeated Spain. The second game we played uh, Netherlands, the number one team a week ago from Europe, we defeated them. The third team was Italy, in Italy, in Italy, we, we, we played Italy. There were maybe 5,000 people in the stadium, 4,900 were cheering for Italy and maybe 100 were cheering for Israel, um, but we defeated Italy. So after the three games, we defeated the top three teams of Europe and Afterwards, Israel defeated South Africa, and we were the Olympic uh, team from Europe to qualify for the Olympics. So it was an amazing thing that the guys did. Again, the, it's very important for the Brazilian Jewish community to understand that. The way the Jewish American players bought into it, um, I like to say they, they drank from the juice. You know, they bought into it and they came and they became Israeli. You know, they were very proud of being Israeli. They all came to Israel. Now it's at least twice they've been to Israel. Um, they went out, they give clinics to all the kids and everything. The kids love them here in Israel. They're, uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook and, and emails back and forth with them and everything. Um, they're really role models for them. And, and they really helped us with baseball in Israel. And they were, you know, now they're all back in America. There's actually one person here still, but they're all going to come back and forth. You know, I don't think anybody's going to live in Israel, maybe when, after they retire, but they have to play baseball in America. They cannot play the level of baseball they play in Israel but they're all very enthusiastic and want to help and everything. And now we had to wait another year for the Olympics because the Olympics was delayed a year by the, because of the Corona. Um, and it's difficult for some of the guys because uh, many of them did not play baseball last year at all, um, the minor leagues and the independent leagues. So it's difficult for them, but now hopefully things will start up again. Now there'll be vaccine and they'll start up again. And team Israel is ready. We're ready to compete for, for a medal in the Olympics. No doubt about it. Oh, that's great. So we can dream the idea to maybe Israel is going to be good in Tokyo. It's going to play a, a... Not maybe. 
Not what me, baby? for sure. For sure. We're going to win a medal. Wow, I'm, that that's... I don't want to say I don't want to say which medal, but we're going to win a medal. I guarantee it. Wow, that's very that's very good to listen. That's great. That's mm -hmm. Uh, I'm gonna follow. I'm gonna start to follow baseball now. Huh? Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's very important for us for the program in Israel because you know Israelis. Uh, not there have been nine Olympic medals from Israelis in the Olympics over the years. Um, the first was the yellow rod with the judo, and judo mm -hmm. now is a, is a huge sport in Israel. Sure. And every Israeli knows who won the medals. And this is the first time that there will be a, a team sport for 42 years in the Olympics. Okay, the last time there was a team sport was in Montreal in, um, in 19, whatever, 78, um, with the a soccer team, with the, with the football team. So this is the first team sport for Israel in the Olympics in, in 45 years. So it's very important for Israel also. And they don't know how to eat it really because, I mean, you know, the Israeli Federation, the IOC in Israel, they know Yael Arad, they know uh, 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 individuals. Okay, okay. They're very, we're very strong in, uh, in gymnastics and... In, uh, in judo, we're very strong, but they don't understand a team. You know, I told them we have, you know, okay, so who are the 24 guys in the team? I said, I don't know. We have 35 players and I have to choose 24 now. I don't know okay. who the 24 are going to be. We have to see what happens during the season with them in the season, uh -huh. what happens to them. But there's going, we're going to have a training camp in, uh, in April, hopefully in Arizona, and then also in July before we go to Tokyo in the Northeast of the United States. And we play exhibition games and everything. And then we'll choose the, the players that will come with the team, with the national team. That's great. Very good. Very good to know this. Uh, please, t t uh, share with us a little bit about, uh, can, can you imagine uh, the one, one day a baseball championship take place in the Middle East with Israel, with non-Muslim uh, team, uh, with Muslim team? How do, you, how do you think this? This is feasible and possible. I know you mentioned you don't like politics, but uh, I'm trying to mix the dream to, to have this possibility? How do you consider this possibility? Uh, listen, with what's going on today, um, you know, uh, UAE, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, uh, Morocco, who knows who will be next? They say Oman will be next, uh, maybe Saudi Arabia. Um, but to be honest with you, all these countries do not have much of a level of baseball. Um, Dubai a little bit and Saudi Arabia only because they have many expatriates. It's not the local people, it's not the Muslim people. Um, the ones in Dubai where we're going to the tournament are Canadian, American, and uh, English, and German. They're not, they're not the, the Dubai, the local people. Um, so the local people do not have much baseball there. Um, there is actually baseball in, in the Gaza Strip. You'd be surprised, but they play baseball in the Gaza Strip. And at one time I was in communication with them a little bit, but. <clears throat> you know, the politics in Israel today, it's very difficult with the Gaza Strip to do anything, to have any kind of contact with them. Um, we do have baseball in the Muslim, in the Arab community in Israel. Um, we have a, a program called Baseball for All, Baseball de Kulam, um, where we bring together Jewish Israelis and Arab Israelis, and they play baseball together. We have a, um, there's a, there's a community, a, a village up in the north of Israel, um, where they have a couple of baseball teams and they play in our leagues. And we definitely, you know, I mean, the Israel national team is open to anybody who's Israeli national. You know, Muslim, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, doesn't matter as long as they have Israeli, Israeli citizenship, you know, they can play for us. No Muslim is yet at that level, but we're definitely looking to see if Muslims can be at that level and play there. Um, I really don't think that, that, that there will be an Israeli, uh, a Middle Eastern baseball tournament just because baseball is not a Middle Eastern sport. Uh, you know, it's more football. Um, is probably the better chance to have a football tournament. Um, we're going to Dubai because it's interesting and it's fun and it will be in the news and maybe we can raise some money from it. And we would be the first national team, Israeli national team to go to Dubai because we're going in March, just before Pesach. We're going to be there for a week. Um, and now we call it together. We call it the Fields of Peace Tournament. So we're making a logo and everything. And it will come out in about a week and in about a week it will be made public. So don't anybody, anybody who watches this, don't, don't say anything yet, be quiet. <laughs> um, but we're, we're going to come out with it and uh, that will be our cooperation with the, in the Arab area, um, in, the, in, the, in the Muslim areas. But uh, to be honest with you, our, our, our vision is more towards Europe, towards America, towards Asia, um, where, baseball, where baseball is much, is much more popular. And maybe towards South America as well. Maybe with Brazil, we could have some exchange programs. That would be very interesting.
Okay, good. So, what do you know about Brazil? Uh, what are your reference? Tell tell us a little bit about what you what you know about. Uh, I, I don't know that much about Brazil. I mean, I traveled around the world a lot. Um, I've traveled in South America. I've traveled to Argentina, uh, to Peru, to uh, Colombia, to Ecuador. Um, so I've been around uh, Venezuela. Um, but to Brazil, I, I've never been. I, I, I always said to myself, Brazil is the one place where I want to go just to Brazil. If I go to South America, I only go to Brazil to travel around Brazil. Um, also in Central America, I've been to Costa Rica and to Guatemala and to Mexico, um, but I'd, I'd love to go to Brazil. I definitely like to go to Brazil. Um, I was actually I was actually in Brazil, I must say, because in, uh, when I was in Argentina, we went to Iguazu and uh, when we were in the water, they said, now we're on the Brazilian side. So I was in Brazil at that, the, when I was on the Brazilian side, side of Iguazu. Um, but I mean, you know, the usual stereotypes that Brazilians have in the eyes of people, the, the Amazon, uh, jungle, the, the beautiful women, uh, the beautiful beaches, uh, football, soccer, football, of course, um, and also a very, a very warm Jewish community. I mean, from what I've uh, read about it, the Jewish community is very warm in Brazil. Um, actually, we had somebody here. Um, he was he was the uh, CEO of our, of our of the baseball, and his wife was uh, was from Brazil. So you know, and she was fantastic. I mean, really, you know, good people and very nice people and very warm and open people. A lot like Israelis. Very much so, no doubt about Very it. Very good. You have a good reference, good. <laughs> Please, uh, what do you tell a child or a teenager, boy or girl here in Brazil who wants to become a baseball player? What would be your three top piece of advice? Um, okay, first of all, the, the most important thing is probably to find a good coach. To find a good coach who can coach him, who can teach him the, 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 the finer points of baseball. Um, certainly at a younger age, it's more of the, the basic uh, skills, but at a later age, it becomes much more psychological, much more mental approach to the game. It's very important that the, the mental approach to the game. Um, the second thing is to, is to work hard, to be dedicated to, to playing baseball, to work hard, to practice often. Baseball is very much of a, of a sport that you have to rely on instincts. You know, you have to know you know, not to think, not to think too much, just to be able to catch the ball, to throw it quickly. What can you do? Different situations. It has to be instinctual. So you have to practice a lot. You have to really be dedicated um, and practice a lot and, and work long hours um, and do everything again and again and again. A lot of repetition is very important. So the, the body becomes doing it in, in a natural way. Um, and the third thing is, is to get a good education, to get a good education because uh, you know, the level of Brazilian baseball is such that if you're, if you're a good student and you're a good baseball player as in Israel, hopefully you can go to a college in America, in the States. And if you can go to a college in the States to study, to get your degree and also to play baseball, we have today um, uh, four Israelis, four Israelis who are playing college ball in the United States. <clears throat> and I don't think any of them will make it a career. You know, in Israel, you have to be in the army for three years. So all our kids between 18 to 21 have to go into the army. Um, and these guys in college are 22, 23, 24 years old. So they won't have much of a professional career, but they will get a college education. And that's what's important to get a college education from playing baseball. By the way, also when, when uh, the army allows certain players to have special dispensations as baseball players, also, also athletes, other athletes, football players and basketball players, of course, but we have about four or five baseball players at one time. So they go to the army for about uh, four or five hours a day. Um, and the rest of the time they can, they can do their sport. And that's, that's important because the three years when you're in the army from 18 to 21 is the three most important years of a, of a career. So at least they can do their sport. They can do a little bit there. They can also go overseas for 90 days a year, up to 90 days a year. So they can go overseas and do things. So the army is very flexible with them. The army allows them to do these kind of things. And that's important. Um, but the same thing to a kid growing up in Brazil to really, to work hard and hopefully at the age of 18, he can go to America and play in a college and play in a better atmosphere um, and, and, and succeed in baseball. Very good, very good, thank you. Uh, it's it possible to develop a foundation for baseball culture in any place. So how do you see this? How, what's your perception about this? 
I tell you, here in Israel, I think also in Brazil, um, a lot of the sports culture is, is very male dominated, um, is very violent. I mean, football, for example, the, the way football is played in Israel, also in Europe, in, in England for sure, I assume also in Brazil and Argentina, um, the people you see at the games are all males, 95% male, um, and 95% you know, yelling and screaming and kill the, kill the referee and, and, and kill the other team and things like that. Baseball is different. Baseball, we try to make it a different climate. Um, we try to make it more family, family oriented. Come together with the family, come together with you know, the, your kids, bring your kids there, bring your daughters there. We have in Israel, um, as I mentioned, about a thousand players. Uh, we have about uh, 20 or 30 girls also playing. Not many, but still there's girls playing. There's also softball. Softball is a separate sport. With, there's, a girls, there's three girls softball teams. So they also play softball. But in baseball, we have about 20 or 30 girls playing among the men. Um, and we try to encourage that. I think it's the same thing in America. In America, they try to make it more of a family thing, bring the family to the ballpark, you know, come to have hot dogs and beer and whatever and bring the whole family. Um, I think baseball in, in, in Central America um, is different, is much more like soccer in Central America, like football. Um, but in Israel, we're trying to make it more of a family kind of thing. And that's important because we want to put values. <clears throat> I mean, uh, you know, be, becoming a leader, for example, leadership in a baseball team is very important. And we try to encourage our young people, our young kids to be leaders, to, to, to lead by example. Um, we belong to an association that tries to build leadership through, uh, through sports. Um, and that's very important. Independence. Um, so we try, to, we try to build things uh, differently than, than the other sports. Um, in Israel. I'm not so sure we're succeeding, but we're trying to succeed. We're, you know, hopefully we're, again, that's also part of the um, baseball here in Israel is, is not totally an Anglo-Saxon, okay, American, but probably about uh, at least 30 or 40 or 50 percent of it is American, but 50 percent is Israeli, native Israelis. Um, but a lot of the, all the more advanced kids, the more advanced levels, the national team levels are more ex-Americans. So they bring that also, that they bring that kind of atmosphere with them as well. Baseball is also a sport. I mean, you play every day. Uh, in the major leagues, they have 160 games. So, you know, it's not like maybe football where you play once a week or twice a week where every game is important. You know, you have to, you, 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 uh, games are important, but there's also tomorrow and there's the next day and you have to worry about that and you have to go forward to them. It's not a life, life threatening thing. Um, so, so that's also, that's also very important. And we try to teach us, we're trying to teach lessons. That's what's, that's what's important for us with the kids. Very good. Very interesting. I, I didn't know about this. Thank you. Well, we are at the beginning of Hanukkah season. Uh, tell, tell, tell us a, a little bit about, uh, your relationship with this traditional of Hanukkah season. What is related to you? What, uh, what you do in Hanukkah season? Well, basically, I mean, um, ironically, since I moved to Israel, I became less religious. Okay, because when I was growing up in New York, I, I wasn't didn't wasn't Shomer Shabbat, but I used to go every Shabbat with my father to synagogue, um, and then I would come home and watch the baseball game on television. But I would still go to synagogue on Shabbat. Um, when I moved to Israel. Because you're here in Israel, you don't have to go to synagogue on Shabbat because there's no need for that. You know, the God is over you, is protecting you anyway because you live here. <laughs> so Shabbat is also only one day. It's only one weekend. It's one day weekend. So you have to take advantage of it to do other things. But certainly Hanukkah is the kind of holiday um, in America. When I was in America, it was different because Hanukkah, you had to compete with Christmas. So it was also very important for the Jewish people to make Hanukkah a much bigger holiday than it is in Israel. In Israel, it's a minor holiday. You light the candles, you know, it's fun. It's nice to light the candles. You sing the Hanukkah songs. You, you eat uh, uh, sufganiyot, which are like jelly donuts. Um, you also eat latke, latke uh, levivot. Um, but, but basically it's, it's, a, it's not the same holiday as, as, as Rosh Hashanah or Pesach. Those are much bigger holidays. It's more of a minor holiday, more for the kids. Um, so we, I mean, I was with my granddaughter the other day, we lit the candles, she tried to blow out the candles because she knows from birthdays that right away you light the candle <laughs> when you blow it out. <laughs> so you have to try to teach her not to blow out the candles. It's understandable. <laughs> yeah, no, she wants to blow it out. That's, that's what she knows for the last two years. 
for whatever exactly. reason. Exactly. Um, but 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 it's uh, you know it's it's a nice holiday in Israel. Again, now with the Corona and everything, it's it's more difficult. You know, you have it's more of a problem. Uh, let's put it this way: last year it was much better. Hopefully, next year it will also be much better. Um, the Corona, by the way, this week they're already starting to give vaccines. Sure. Um, Israel will have I don't know four or five million vaccines within the next month or so. So, for some miraculous way, Israel is going to be probably the first country to vaccinate the entire population, um, which is fantastic, which is great for us. Um, I know in Brazil, you have a, a leader there who's very similar to, uh, to Trump in the United States. At least the Americans got rid of Trump. I don't know about the Brazilians getting rid of their, their, their leader, um, but I know that the situation in Brazil is also very, very difficult. Um, yeah, sure. Hopefully, within six months, the whole world will be finished with the corona and everything will be over with, and then we can move forward. But it's nice having Hanukkah here. It's the third third candle tonight, and it's a very very nice holiday. And uh, you know, I have Hanukkah greetings from Israel to everybody in, in in Brazil who's watching this now. Thank you, thank you. We are closing to the our nice conversation. Please feel free to make your final remarks, final comments to us. Uh, the only thing I want to say is, listen. I mean, we, we're we're a small country, the Jewish people. We're a small nation, okay? The Jewish people in Brazil, the Jewish people in America, the Jewish people in Israel, um, maybe 20 million people all over the world. Um, I know that we, our influence is much greater than that, um, but we're really, we're really small and we have to be together. And I think the, the, the Israel national baseball team, the Olympic baseball team is, a, is an example, a great example of how the American Jewish players are coming together with their Israeli brothers, their Israeli baseball brothers, and able to build a team that can compete in an international forum, international stage. I mean, the Olympics are the biggest stage that can be. Um, and because we have 20 American Jewish baseball players who made Aliyah, who made the actual process of becoming Israeli citizens, not living in Israel, but becoming Israeli citizens, visiting often, being part of the program, being part of us, going to together to Tokyo to represent Israel, um, they're taking a big chance. I mean, they're going to represent Israel, which means that each of those players has a target on their back. Obviously, we're not the most desired people in the world. Um, and they're telling everybody they're Jewish, okay? And Jews are also not very much liked in the world, unfortunately. Um, but they're coming, and that kind of cooperation between the Jewish Americans and the Israeli, the Israeli Jewish people is the kind of cooperation that I like to see among other Jewish people. I know a lot of Brazilians come to Israel and support Israel, <clears throat> very strong supporters of Israel. Um, and hopefully we'll come on Aliyah, more and more Brazilians will come on Aliyah. Um, but it's also important to be in Brazil and to influence things and things that are going on in Brazil. Um, right now, the team is, 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 has to be self-funded. Um, we have a budget of about $1 million for expenses from now until the Olympics. Um, we wanna have the camps and we wanna have the camps in the States and we have to get uniforms, we have to get training and everything. We have to fly different places. About 20, 25% will be funded by the Israeli government. Unfortunately, the Israeli government does not have many resources um, to help fund it. And, and also anybody who knows about the Israeli government knows that the budget that they're working on now in almost 2021 is the same budget as they had in 2018. Okay, because the governments have not, they've, four different governments have not been able to pass a budget. Um, so in 2018, there was no Israeli team going to the Olympics. <laughs> and we have a team of 24 players and 10 coaches, that's 34 players that we have to almost fund by ourselves. So perhaps when this is shown, we can also show the, uh, the, the, the website where we can donate money, where we can get donors to donate money. Um, it'd be great if uh, people could donate money to help us get the team there. We're also building fields in Israel, baseball fields in Israel, as I mentioned in the beginning in Beit Shemesh and Renana. Um, there's tractors there on the Beit Shemesh field right now for phase one of the Beit Shemesh field. We have basically one baseball field in Israel um, in Petah Tikva with, with lights um, and we're building two new fields. So we need funding also to build those two new fields. And there's a saying in English, um, if you build it, they will come. And uh, that's why we're building the fields because when a child comes and sees the baseball field and you know, also a, a football field, same thing but he sees a big green grassy area and he sees people playing and, and you know, action going on there. It makes it a much different feeling than when he comes and sees a, 
a soccer field or an empty lot or something and is just playing there. It's a field that's dedicated to baseball. And if any, anybody who's watching this right now comes to Israel in the next year or two years or three years and wants to come see a game, please get in touch with me. Be happy to host you at a game, to have you there. Um, and just uh, happy Hanukkah to everybody. Um, I don't know when this will be shown, if it will be shown on Hanukkah or after Hanukkah, but uh, happy Hanukkah and happy new year um, to everybody and to all my Brazilian fans out there, please uh, help support us and uh, thank you very much. Okay, Peter, thank you. Thank you very much for your participation. Whenever you want to visit in Brazil, we'll be delighted to welcome you, take you to the soccer stadium to watch a game and take you around to show you this beautiful country. And uh, I wish my best and good luck to your team and happy Hanukkah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.